Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to this uh, emergency edition of a, uh, a, a fireside chat. We are putting on a, a, a log on the fire, as it were, to talk about the big Log4j exploit that has just hit the internet. Um, with me are a bunch of uh, Bishop Fox uh, experts here to talk about it. Um, I'm Dan Peter. I'm going to kind of orchestrate this. I'm a lead researcher here at Bishop Fox, do a lot of R&D things. So um, I'm going to let uh, the team go around and uh, introduce themselves. Maybe start with uh, Ori. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Ori Zigendre, uh, Cosmos Director of Operations. Joe? Uh, my name is Joe DeMacy. I'm a Principal Consultant in charge of the Red Team. And Justin? And I'm Justin Reinhardt. I'm a Senior Analyst over on the Cosmos team. Cool. All right. So, uh, yeah, this has been kind of taking up all of our day today. Today is Friday as we're um, recording this, uh, Friday, December 10th. And uh, so what do we know about this Log4j exploit as of right now? Like, what is Log4j and how does this exploit work? Justin, you want to start? Yeah, uh, Log4j, like uh, Log Utility in Java, um, right? It's put out by Apache, so it's used in a lot of Apache's different projects. Um, I, there's a list, posted a list of them uh, in our blog, but, you know, it's things like, like struts and, uh, you know, spring framework and like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I would of, say uh, it's, a, it's a nearly ubiquitous Java logging framework from a, like, it's incredibly common, um, for anywhere from enterprise to other open source projects. It, if it's, if it's written in Java, it, probably is using log for j so yeah and even things that don't come with it, that don't use it by default like uh tomcat like in their section on logging they have explicit instructions on how to set up it log for j like in tomcat so it's yeah it's ubiquitous enough that even if it, your project or if a project doesn't use it by default there are instructions in the official documentation on how to set it up so it's, so it's everywhere it's yeah <laughs> So the, the exploit is like, as long as your program uses log4j for logging, right? And like, it's almost like a format string vulnerability. You like uh, explode this uh, kind of like custom yeah. format thing. And then it's so like, uh, walk me through- String interpolation. Happens. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's this takes me back to uh, Citrix. Uh, was yeah. that two years ago? I uh, had a format string type of vulnerability, which, uh, ended up resulting in lots of remote code execution on, on the edge devices. Um, it also is reminiscent of, of uh, the shell shock vulnerability that was uh, part of, um, uh, you know, Apache, like you could just uh, exploit an Apache server by sending a, a certain type of string, um, which lived in environments for a very long time. And I per personally expect this one to live in environments for a very long time as well. So how do you yeah, actually it, like leverage this for code execution though? Yeah, es essentially what happens is if, if there's an attacker controlled value that gets passed to the logging library, the attacker can basically exploit the string interpolation feature within log4j to trigger an object deserialization uh, condition, which then triggers arbitrary code execution uh, on the remote server. It, I think the only saving grace in this is that certain versions of the JVM are not vulnerable, at least by default. Um, but, uh, you know, given that this is, you know, Java's very enterprise oriented software, older technologies tend to, uh, persist a little bit longer than it would be ideal in an enterprise environment. So I think that's why this is so common is that, uh, you know, this type of stuff is generally running on older systems on older versions of the JVM. Um, and oftentimes in, in situations where it's difficult to, to up, update, to, to fix it. So. There's gonna be a really long tail on this one, I think. Yeah, my understanding of that was that, um, so the exploit will do a JNDI lookup to a remote uh, resource, right? Mm -hmm. And that the JV, like newer versions of the JVM prov uh, try to prevent that end of it, right? Like yeah. the, the class loading, the remote class loading. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's already people like out in the InfoSec Twitterverse talking about ways to get around that or clever ways of still exploiting things nonetheless, so. Um, I'm not sure that that's the, the I wouldn't feel too comfortable yeah. if you haven't updated. You should yet. still update. Yeah, you, there's a mitigation yeah. where you can set uh, a command line flag or an environment variable uh, to disable that. But 
you should still update the the library uh, where possible. Um, although, yeah, there, Java has all sorts of problems with with object deserialization. This seems this certainly seems like the most obvious way to exploit the vulnerability, but there definitely could be more um, that people just haven't thought of yet. So it's worth noting too that the like the POC that you've seen or the like JNDI you know, colon LDAP, um, you could nest like tags in there too. So like, it doesn't always, right? Like if you're writing writing WAF rules that are, are very strict, um, you're going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of bypasses for a lot of WAF rules that are being put out. Yes, yeah, so that sort of gets us into mitigations, right? So like, uh, <laughs> We're seeing like we're seeing clients that are just shutting down servers in response. Like they don't even want to deal with it. Um, so like, what can you do right now, like as of Friday, December tenth, to actually mitigate your servers against this sort of thing? So there, there is a command line option to set the uh, the ver to disable the the feature in in Log4j, which you can set. So when, when you execute a Java application, you basically you can pass arguments to the JVM to specify certain configuration options. Uh, and there is at least a configuration option to disable this functionality, even in affected versions. So that's a good short-term uh, mitigation for the problem. In addition to you know, WAFs, like uh, Justin was talking about, a WAF may be able to prevent certain naive attempts to exploit this type of problem. Um, but really, the, the long-term solution is to update the vulnerable uh, library, assuming you have, you know, assuming you actually, it's your own, you know, code. Um, if it's a vendor product, you know, you'll probably have to wait for an update uh, from the vendor. There's another interesting aspect of this where, um, like for Cosmos customers, for instance, we have a list of targets that we're going after trying to validate the vulnerability. But along the path, there may be other edge devices that where the vulnerability can get triggered from and give yeah. us a callback. And in and of itself, it is a false positive, uh, but there is still something vulnerable out there. So it's uh, it's an interesting problem and it's kind of hard to uh, get around to get like some real mm -hmm. good uh, distilled information out of uh, the scans that we're completing right now. Yeah, I yeah. think if you add the environment uh, uh, variable disclosure into that, you can. So there's a, you can chain this with another problem um, to disclose server side uh, environment variables, and that you can use to kind of fingerprint different devices uh, by you know trying to to dump host name or, or something or the user and things like that. Um, so it, as well as you know, especially in today's world of containerization. And, and everything, it's extremely common to have things like AWS keys and environment variables, which really exacerbates the situation uh, because you can disclose those values through the DNS lookup that uh, people are using to detect whether or not the application is vulnerable. Um, so that in itself, it can be used uh, as an attack, even without the code execution piece. So. So uh, one of my first reactions when I was looking at this was like, oh, like here's yet another instance of like Java, you know, loading remote Java objects from untrusted sources. Mm -hmm. And like, how does this keep on happening? Like, how is JNDI like lookup still a thing? Like, what what is going on here, right? Like, how much of this is like specifically some like weird functionality in Log4j to blame? Is this like, is this something need to change in Java generally? Um, like, what are some of like our higher level like um, takes on this so far? Yeah, I mean, serialization is incredibly common in sort of the Java ecosystem. Um, and you know, early on, it was it was like kind of a you know a, a core feature of the language, and one of the reasons why it became so popular. You know, RMI has had its fair share of security problems as well. Um, so I think part of this is like serialization, object serialization is just incredibly common in not, I mean, not only Java, I mean, we're picking on Java, but object serialization is generally common in other languages as well. But, um, you know, it's just, it's very common. It's just so easy to trigger. I think that's the thing with Java is that you can, you can trigger object serialization conditions in uh, situations which are not necessarily intuitive or obvious to the programmer that it's going to trigger this type of condition. You know, it, it kind of happens in the background automatically um, rather than explicitly. 
uh, some of the time. So whenever you have that sort of condition, you know, when, whenever you're, you, the pr programmer is performing an action which they don't understand the full implications of, that's oftentimes where you get these types of vulnerabilities from. So It almost uh, becomes I, I, unsafe to resolve a URI at all. I would say, uh, generally speaking, it is already <laughs> uh, in almost any language, but... Um, um, I was going to say, it, it, this is not a new thing. This is not the first time we're seeing uh, a command injection happening via log, log injection. This has been around for quite a while. Other languages have suffered similar problems before. Um, I think that at the, uh, like when, when developers are writing code, they just need to be thinking more defensively about how they accept user input. And in this particular case, again, no sanitization happening. Uh, is is causing this issue. That's the that's the main issue yeah. here. So it's not Java specific. Uh, it's not package specific. It's uh, it's everywhere. This could this could have happened in any language, any framework. Yeah, and I think it's yeah. also worth saying that like it's going to. I feel like we're going to be seeing more of these things coming along too, right? As whenever like with the exchange vulnerabilities, right? Once there was one, it started. You know, more people started looking into it. And it's uh, so I feel like we're going to probably be seeing a lot more of these very similar type things coming down the pipe as well. Yeah, some blood in the water right now. So, uh, so talking mitigation again, right? So you've got a custom web application that's internet facing. You update your log4j uh, like software on that makes sense, obvious, right? But like, there's lots of downstream tools like we were talking about that might be using log4j that you're using. That you might not even know exist. So like, this is how we're finding shells and things that we didn't even intend on exploiting because you can kind of just like shove a payload in a request and then like shells start coming your way. Um, uh, so like, what else can you do in your environment to help try mitigating against this? Right. So we've got like like WAF rules or like uh, uh, exfiltration, like like locking down or like what can like uh, do, what helps there? What doesn't? I'm not a blue teamer, so take what I'm about to say with a huge grain <laughs> of salt, but lots and lots and lots of monitoring, uh, a, a heavy dose of WAF rules, uh, you know, using uh, uh, a decent number of, of WAFs in front of your applications will definitely help, but it's not foolproof. Yeah, I would say also like anything that talks like to another system, like for example, like, um, you see it's super common with XSS payloads where like you fire a payload somewhere and it might not trigger for three months where, you know, someone decides that they wanted to export some data into a CSV and load it in somewhere else. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have this, you know, this payload that fires and you have no idea where it came from because, it, you know, it's something that, you know, a developer or, you know, an analyst on the back end. So like just being very, very cautious with anywhere you send data in any you know connected or related systems i i also feel like uh you know how the uh uh the the icar uh string that is used for an antivirus testing i think this will kind of become one of those things where people will just randomly shove it in different places input fields email subject lines uh, whatever you can think of and then just see hey can i get a call back and it will probably happen yeah, I saw someone change their iPhone name uh, to the payload, and then that yep. triggered. Uh, triggered so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. It's worth noting that it's also not only web stuff, right? Like, there's people sending it in, e like the subject and you know bodies of emails and that kind of thing, and seeing it fire from there, people, you know, renaming <laughs> their yeah their iPhones and their wireless networks and any everything everywhere is kind of. Uh, how this is getting done. And because of that, right, it makes remediation difficult. It makes finding things difficult because, you know, there's, you know, with any, you know, decently sized web application, there's a million places where you can provide, you know, some sort of input or, or you're, you know, taking in arbitrary data. So it's, yeah, it's going to have a very long tail. So um, the, without, Direct network access, right? Is there a, what what uh, avenues for exploitation are there um, with the JNDI lookup? Because if you can't suppose like you don't have the network access, right? 
to do the JNDI lookup to like an attacker controlled server? Um, like what can you do to like try to exploit that kind of machine that might be like way back end or like just behind a, like some restrictive exfiltration rules? Yeah, well, like I said, you know, you can also use this to disclose environment variables and then you can put those into DNS queries. So that by itself is, is exploitable and doesn't require any type of line of sight networking between the attacker and the affected system. So, yeah, and I, we are seeing a lot of a lot of machines that uh, do have right. That, well, the only exploitation we can get is DNS, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of blocking going on, and I mean to that extent, like there's. Even you know from a few hours ago, like seeing these systems just drop off, uh, you know the number of responses we get back from payloads is you know dropping off pretty rapidly. So yeah, that's so, probably because they're all mining Monero. So. <laughs> yeah, they're being CPUs maxed out. <laughs> yeah, they're being patched by the uh, by whoever got there first. <laughs> A while ago, I've I've seen a picture on I, I think it was Twitter uh, that had a picture of a, a mini server rack with a sign in front of it that said, "In case of hack, pull cables, break glass, and pull cables." <laughs> I think that's probably what people are doing right now. Uh, it feels like we're, their response. Yeah, it feels like something out of a movie. It's like they're like they're running to cut the hard line, like as we're literally <laughs> like trying to like hack the thing. Like it's it's insane. Like we've never seen something like that before, or at least not in a long time. I mean, as long as long as it's not a business critical application, you can you can kind of get away with that, right? And it's obviously the safest approach. Um, I think where it becomes a much more difficult issue is when it is in like business critical applications that you can't just like take down. You know? So it's hard to compare these things apples to apples, right? But is this worse than a heart bleed? Like, how bad is this in the scale of like massive internet vulnerabilities? Like. I've been I've already seen some people trying to make that comparison and maybe it's too soon to say, but I don't know. What are you what are your opinions? Well, Heartbeat was only a memory leak. So that that sort of limited it's I mean, it was still very exploitable, especially under certain conditions. But this is like in many situations, this is just direct code execution. Um, so from that standpoint, I would say this is the Probably, I, I would say like shell shock in this are, are worse than Heartbleed, even though Heartbleed it was like so prevalent, you know. Um, and the, I think the difference there is like Heartbleed is in like core operating system libraries that get updated even less frequently than core application libraries like this one. So um, they're both in sort of difficult to, to update areas in, in a lot of cases, but I would say this is probably worse, at least from an impact standpoint. It may be less pervasive across the entire internet than Heartbleed, but impact, I think, is, is quite a bit higher. Yeah, and I mean, it's that's something that we're mentioning these like three things alone outside of every other vulnerability that we've seen, right? Like the fact that, you know, these these are the three that are kind of like jockeying for position here. Like it's definitely says something about the current like status of it. The, the fact that uh, when when you're installing certain applications, it it flashes the sign that says three billion plus devices run Java, it just kind of tells us the magnitude of this. Where uh, mm -hmm. obviously not every Java application is using this package, but still, uh, it's prevalent. And I I've referenced it a couple times today to multiple people as like shell shock on steroids. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it it feels that way at least. Yeah, you can even target Windows with this one. So, uh, yeah, cross platform. Yep. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, I think that's uh, about all the questions that I had. Um, do we have any parting thoughts, I guess, uh, going into the weekend here? Uh, yeah, uh, Cosmo service is uh, up and running, and we have our scans going uh, all weekend long. Uh, if any additional uh, targets that are identified will be uh, almost real time identifying uh, clients so that they can start their remediation process. Cool. All right. Well, uh, cool. thanks for everybody for watching.